Hey everyone, and welcome to the podcast here at uh, Very Solutions. My name is Kevin DeLong, and this podcast is going to be just a little bit different because um, right now, well, you're just hearing my audio. So what happened here is that I had an interview with a student. She had some questions. Uh, her name is Kylie Wright, and she had some questions about getting started in the uh, digital forensics field, what to do, some advice on that. Uh, unfortunately, her audio and video didn't turn out. I didn't record all that well. So what I've done is I put all of her questions up on a graphic and then I go and answer said question. So without further ado, here are those questions. Wow. Well, that is a huge, uh, huge question. Um, it really depends on... Um, what specialty in, in digital forensics that you're going to do. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, there's, um, um, you know, straight computer forensics, right? Or what, what was called dead box type forensics. There's also mobile forensics. Then there's uh, the whole um, cyber security and cyber type online network security type of forensics. Uh, and now IOT, right, is, is out. So it really depends on what area you're going to kind of specialize in or what area that interests you um, the most. So, and I know people probably say this all the time, the best experiences is, is to find a, a great lab that you can either get part-time work in or, um, you know, internship on your available free time hours. Cause a lot of internships, I, I came from the law enforcement background and I always, always had an intern in, in my lab, always, just because I know it's tough to get internships and it's, it's tough to see those kind of things. And a lot of labs won't let people inside uh, to see what's going on. But, um, you know, I had my interns handle certain things and they'd work literally every piece of the case with me. So, you know, it, it the experience is different depending on where you go um, and um, the, the type of person that's, that's helping you along. I always believed in, hey, have at it, <laughs> you know, go at it and, and, and get what you can. So internships, you know, everyone says that internships are the best and sometimes they are and sometimes they're not so great. It really depends on the uh, on where you get and, and the people in that environment. Um, but um, kind of what you need to do as well as, as best be prepared for it is start getting to know the industry. Now, you and I originally met at uh at an Ohio HTCIA event, correct? Yeah, so perfect what you were doing there, um, getting out and, and meeting people that are in the industry already and asking those questions and, uh, and learning as absolutely much as, as, as you can. Uh, so that is a huge experience. Uh, and, you know, finding somebody to um, be your mentor and to kind of help you along and and ask questions, but obviously be respectful because most of the people that I know my own mentors in the industry, they all have jobs as well, right? Uh, the people that I look up to. So I'm careful of what I ask them and I'm careful and respect their time, but find a mentor. It's very important to do that. So someone just starting out, and again, this depends on what flavor that you're going into law enforcement organizations um you know or pro law enforcement organizations are one side of it like um iasis is very pro law enforcement but they do have a private side as well um, so cer their certification is is very top notch in my opinion um, it's challenging to get it's not something that uh, like some of the vendor training that you may or may not have experienced before that you could show up attend five days of class and boom you get a certificate for taking a 50 question test or something like that you know um theirs is very different theirs is a uh, couple weeks of training iasis down in florida i think that's i'm pretty sure they still have it down there when i went through back in 08 um so good 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 and you can i believe you can still join that organization um and um without going through all of their training and kind of work your way through Obviously, what you we've already done with HTCIA, I'm a huge fan of HTCIA. Uh, the problem is um, if you're doing defense work, and I don't look down on anyone doing any type of work, even though I, I come from the law enforcement side of the world, is that it's all digital forensics. It's all, 
and this is going to be a very cliche thing, it's all ones and zeros essentially. So it doesn't really matter in my opinion. However, um, HTCI has very clear rules on what you can and can't do um, to be uh, a member of their organization, which I completely respect that. Like I said, I'm a huge fan. I do a lot of stuff with HTCIA. Um, uh, again, just for the networking alone and the free trainings and the uh, seminars that they have and the conferences that they have, uh, fantastic. Get involved in those, in, in those groups. Um, even on um, LinkedIn and um, Facebook, there's groups there. Uh, start looking into there. Uh, Certification-wise, um, CFCE, I want to say, is the one on the private sector side. Um, um, not necessarily private sector side, but it's more for the uh, defenders, people doing defense work uh, that can't get uh, the things on the IASIS side. Um, so those are, are, are a couple certifications. Then it really depends on what type of, of role that you're going to get from there. If you're going to do a lot of dead box forensics, the vendor certs are almost a requirement anymore. Right, because if you go in and you have to give testimony or really stand behind your findings, you have to know how to use that tool. So, tools like the the access data tools, the uh, guidance tools, uh, Celebrites tools, Parabens tools, Katana tools, all of the tools, no matter what you're using, go and find uh, their certification process and uh, go from there. And there's, there's really no um, titles that are standardized in the industry, which is, to me, strange. Um, I think I went off on a, I go off on rants occasionally, and I think I went off on a rant on this um, several years back. Um, in, in my opinion, there's essentially a couple different levels, if you know, you would say, right? There's, and and I think there's a few organizations that are that are kind of adopting that as well. And again, I don't think it was anything that I recommended it's just they saw the same things that I was seeing in the industry um, is that the operator type level so what I consider and again this is going to vary depending on where you go uh, what I consider the operator type level is someone who knows how to acquire data who knows how to get the information and get the information properly Right, so a lot of the times you're gonna hear it's like, oh, all I'm gonna do is imaging. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of stinkage, your first job, but hey, sometimes that's what you gotta do in order to build up. But imaging is a lot, you know, they could send you places like um, if you get a job at uh, XYZ company, um, depending on that corporation itself, they may say, be sending you to multiple places uh, around the globe uh, to image things. It's like, hey, we have 30 computers in Asia that needs imaged guess who's gets to go that'd be the person in the imaging team right or the operator type level um, or the acquisition so it's not always a bad deal but you do have to kind of pay dues unfortunately uh, as you as you move through through uh, ranks so if you can find something like that that's fantastic um, so entry level title mm. so a lot of entry level organizations are kind of the big uh, uh, organizations out there um, like Deloitte is one of those um, and, th and there's several of them there, there, there's three big ones and gosh my brain is just gonna uh, KPMG is another um, and th so if you can get in at one of those organizations um, and do your time they're gonna teach you so much about the industry it's insane um, I personally have never worked there, but I am friends with a lot of people that's been through those cycles and they learn a lot and they learn a lot quick because they're literally thrown to the fire, right? They're thrown to the fire. If you're coming from the private sector, uh, I would recommend pursuing one of those types of, uh, of scenarios, especially if you've had formal education and training, they really look highly upon that. Right, so oh, this is probably the, the largest challenge and I don't know that anyone's keeping up <laughs> because technology is moving so fast. I was always a mobile forensic guy in, uh, in my lab 
that's where I excelled. That's where I loved, and it was it was fun just because I it was different all the time. Um, um, I, I used to do standard computer forensics or dead box forensics, but that got boring after a while because it was generally the same thing over and over again. You look here, you look there, you look there, and that was just me. But you know, there, it's a huge area in itself, so I'm not knocking that area because there's there's more that I will never know in that area. Mobile was the fun part for me. Um, and I liked the research. I enjoyed staying up on the latest trends. So kind of personally what I do, what my, what each and every morning consists of for me is I will wake up, help my wife get the kids ready for school and then off to school. And then I'm there and I try to dedicate 30 minutes to a full hour almost um, to reading the latest uh, social media, um, all the RSS feeds, on the internet that are related to my topic. I, I follow, uh, obviously, um, anything DFIR, uh, also cybersecurity, because everything's kind of a, a big crossover nowadays, right? Um, so I'll be looking at that. I'll uh, look at the trends, also what's happening. Uh, you know, Twitter, and believe it or not, Facebook, which pains me some days, but I do check out Facebook to see what's going on there. Um, and then probably the best one for our industry, um, the, well, the top two is uh, LinkedIn. If you're not on LinkedIn, every student should be on LinkedIn, uh, starting to make connections there um, and, and going that route. And, and then Twitter. Those two are the big ones within the DFI, our community. But then there's other things like uh, Forensic Focus has forums out there. Uh, and there, there's just so many out there. I, I don't want to, I hate to call out one or two uh, by name, but uh, there's a lot of forensic blogs out there um, a as well. So, um, you know, I read a lot of those, and that's what I try to just skim through everything and, and read articles that I find relevant and important to the, the industry. And that's how I stay up. It is a daily affair, and I kid you not, it is every day. And sometimes it may be twice a day because I'll see something that somebody posts that I missed completely. And I'm going, ah, how did I miss that? So I go back and I, uh, I, uh, I, I'll read that article or do a little research on it. Whew. So the, the scope has changed a lot since I got started um, in digital forensics because I was a street cop first. That's, that's what I did. Um, and um, one day, what was it? I can't remember the, the catalyst now. It's crazy. It's been so long ago. But... You know, we're starting to look at cell phones and, com well, not cell phones at that time, but just computer systems. It's like, hey, we know there's evidence here. Um, what can we get off of these things? Oh, I remember who it was. Um, it was um, uh, Jim Baker at uh, the Lima Police Department. At that time, Jeff Kinkle also at the police department. They were just starting this up, and I kind of just gravitated that way um, and then dug my teeth into it and just and just ran with it. Um, so obviously my story is going to be a little bit different, um, and, and to get funding, what we did is uh, um, we formed a task force in Northwest Ohio. We brought in a lot of the smaller agencies, um, not that where I worked was a, a large agency by any means, it was a, a small to medium sized agency, and uh, we brought in all these other agencies um, to help fund the organization, um, Technology Crime, so that's where I got um, kicked off. So I guess the advice that I would have is seek out resources. That's what I did right away. I got involved in HTCIA right away. There was no delay in that. I found out about this organization and I just started um, um, researching as much as I, I possibly could um, about each one of these uh, organizations and trying to find the best fit for me. Um, so what's going to work for me is not going to work for someone else. Um, be persistent, don't give up, <laughs> network with as many people as you can. That, and a lot of people are afraid of that, which I've noticed. Um, and um, but, but don't be afraid to ask the questions. Don't be afraid to approach somebody that's been around forever in the industry. Like um, a funny story, which I've, I've told on one of my other podcasts uh, that I had before, was that um, uh, Brian Carrier, he wrote the book called File System Forensics. Um, and if you haven't read that book, you should read that book. It was the, uh, I, don't, I don't know how dated it is now. Gosh, I'm dating myself, but it, excellent book. Um, and 
uh, just by crazy chance, uh, I was at a, uh, a conference in, in Myrtle Beach, and uh, I was standing there talking to some people, and this guy was standing there too, and he was involved in the conversation, and then it was just me and him talking for a long time. I didn't know who this guy was. And then another one of my colleagues come up and um, starts talking to him, and I realized this is Brian Carrier, right, that I'm sitting here talking with, which is kind of like a, oh, wow, you're like been in the industry forever, and here I am, just had no clue who he was. Um, but uh, and I, I don't know that I would have talked to him otherwise if I'd have known who he was. Just, you know, you got to get over that intimidation factor. And it's a matter, no matter who you are, I know everyone has it, go and talk to people. Uh, and just say, hey, I appreciate what you're doing in the industry and start a conversation with them. Um, and that's the best way to start getting traction. And they can introduce you to people. And if they know of a job opening or they know of something um, and they and you, and you stand out in their mind, they'll remember that. And they'll go, oh, wait a minute. Hey, I know this person. That may be a perfect fit for what you're looking for. And you make connections that way. I've made more connections in this industry by just getting to know people. Um, my skills, average in this industry, right? But it's knowing people that really makes a huge difference. Um, so that's my advice to anyone in the industry is network and don't be afraid because a lot of people are afraid to show their shortcomings um, of what they know and what they don't know. And I have no fears of that anymore because I, that, that now is a plus. Because if you don't know something, I'm going to find out. I'm going to seek it out and I'm going to learn it as best that I can. I'm going to find those people that, that know those topics that can help me out. So that's the best advice I could possibly give to you. Thank you.